So the patient's understanding of illness is obviously, as for example, Susan Sontag reminds us in her very prominent book, Illness as Metaphor, a patient's illness is the experience of being a person who has lost capacity or lost potential. Decades ago, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote that those who are ill are up against a kind of wall, while the rest of the people around them, including their closest intimates, can talk about the future and what's going to happen to the future. Those who face a terminal illness cannot look past the wall because there is no future. So when you know anything is being discussed, even the most mundane topic like football, well, it's not so mundane for some of us, um, they can't go there. And that wall creates a kind of difficulty in maintaining relationships as they previously existed. And as I said, there's a strain that happens since all of our relationships are tested most when we are ill, or at least so Zaner puts it. So what is it to be ill really for the purpose of a clinical ethicist or an ethics committee? It means that when a patient brings their autobiography, they're also bringing, as you'll hear in the cases that Drs. Johnson and Rizal talk about, they bring a story that doesn't always get told in its entirety, that shifts so that a patient will come into an ethics consult, and you'll hear, as I did once in an ethics consult, someone say, you know what, I just could not live with dialysis. Why, you might ask, as the only person in the institution who would ask that question. And they might say, as one patient said to me, because I, will, I, I won't be able to work that way. I won't be able to live that way. I can't coexist in my family with my kids. I can't play. I can't do this, that, and the other thing. And listening to that patient talk about dialysis instigated what you might not even want to call an ethics consult. It was really a discussion about not just the patient's goals, but the patient's understanding of what was wrong with him, about what it meant to him to have to have a treatment of a certain kind. We understand illness to mean that we've hit a wall and that there may be options for us, but it's very hard in that alien environment, surrounded by strangers, awakened every three hours, to consider sometimes what it would mean to have the treatment. Talking to the patient I mentioned, it was simply a matter, in order that he was at considerably greater ease, to just tell him, dialysis doesn't have to be what you think it will be. It could be a few hours, once or twice a week, coming into a clinic. It doesn't mean that you're going to be hooked up to pipes all the time, and so on. And in his case, that made all the difference in the world. It meant to him what he hadn't considered, that he could keep working, that he could continue with his life. Illness, then, is the experience for a patient of the asymmetry of the therapeutic diet. On the one side, all the power is in the hands of those who see us naked. And as I'll talk about in a few minutes, it's that unbelievable trust that we are forced to give when we are patients to caregivers that makes it a dyad in the first place. Illness is understanding ourselves in the context of the very powerful as they are responsible for both telling us what we might need to make a decision and also guiding us when there isn't any decision to be made. The therapeutic dyad then has to do with being in a precarious role where we all of us engaged in the clinical enterprise deal with the complexities of a person in their life outside the hospital and the complexity of, the, of that person inside the hospital. Are they just a patient? Are they a patient and a research subject? Are they insured? How many beds are there for this patient? And that, of course, also applies in particular to neonatal patients and others like that who wouldn't be speaking for themselves in a variety of circumstances. So it's a dyad. And the medical side of that dyad has a kind of moral tradition, too. It has two pieces. One is really obvious. It comes from the code that we think of as the Hippocratic Oath. It's really the Hippocratic corpus, and as medical historian Ludwig Edelstein puts it, if you look at the battles among those who kind of gave physicians a way to think about what they owed patients, beyond that Hippocratic Oath is a whole way of talking about what it is to be a doctor. There's that, the code. There are other codes as well, many different ones, codes for nurses, for allied health professionals, and for nurse practitioners. And these codes stand as a kind of living organism that 
people aren't so much, you know, there's not a toothy police squad that comes in and arrests you if you break the Hippocratic Oath. And most medical students, in fact, now take the oath, but they didn't until three or four years ago. But those codes are an underpinning. On the other side, there are policies that we've talked about that structure the institutions in which we work. In the final analysis, though, maybe more important than that is the institutional power and the relationships, knowledge, and the kind of precarious notion of the institution that's present on the side of the therapeutic dyad that has to do with how people are treated. When you come in as a clinical ethics consultant, for example, you're not, in most institutions, going to be like the cardiac consultant who bills from whom a patient or Medicaid or the hospital will absorb some kind of billing code. You come in in a really weird role. Years and years ago when clinical ethics started, they couldn't come up with a way to describe people. Dr. Zayner was described as a phenomenologist and he wore a little badge that said house phenomenologist that literally was meaningless to absolutely everybody. If you're not a philosopher, you've never heard of phenomenology in, in, in all likelihood. That badge means something. That coat means something, as we all know and as doctors often discuss. On the other hand, though, beyond that, there's this absolutely essential fact. The clinical ethicist isn't even the nurse from the standpoint that the nurse plays a role in institutional settings such as hospitals, our 5,000 hospitals around the U.S., and literally the tens of thousands of hospitals around the world in which you might work. In the United States, nurses themselves in hospitals are mostly built like the furniture. They're just built into the cost. Clinical ethics, very much like pastoral care or chaplaincy, is kind of built into the fabric of the institution. And so you come into a therapeutic dyad where there is forced trust by patients. They don't, not, they don't have a choice but to trust you as they're naked and treated. And you yourself must engage the conversation from there. So that's a starting point, or at least one, that we can take before we start to talk about the theory that can help us as we navigate those waters.